to child rights advocate and teddy bear clinic director dr shahida omar who joins us now dr omar good evening firstly your reflections on the sentence that was handed down today and the, this case overall did you feel that the magistrate went far enough in effecting justice here i think once again this is a sad day in the history of south africa where systems have failed our children if we look at the sentencing the, uh, the punishment that was handed out that is not compatible with the crime, crime and the extent and the gravity and the enormity of the situation is so grave and the long lasting implications in the lives of these children that have been affected by this child pornography will be a life sentence from for them because it's been posted on the internet and people will still have access or have captured those images and saved it. So for those children, they will be wanted lifetime for it. And the effect that it could have on their trajectory is something that we cannot even begin to understand or comprehend. So as I say, I think the criminal justice system has certainly failed our children. And the message given out or meted out there to potential offenders is actually that it's laughable, the lighthearted, the lax sentence that has been uh, given to the convicted criminal is something we cannot accept or justify. There needs to be zero tolerance for this kind of sentences that are meted out for such heinous and horrific crimes against the most marginalized and population group are our children who are absolutely powerless and helpless and unable to protect and ensure their safety. What do you think would have been a more appropriate sentence in this particular matter? Well, I mean, appropriate would certainly be a much more harsher sentence where there would be zero tolerance for you know, allowing this kind of uh, criminal offenses to be conducted because it would send out a very strong message to other potential offenders not to commit such a crime. Uh, so getting a life sentence because it is a life sentence for the children that have been affected by this uh, crime, by the distribution and capturing of child porn. So definitely this is not acceptable. One of the things that this case also does is that it, 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 of course, creates an opportunity for us to look at the exploitation of children, especially for, for content that is posted online. And there are various facets with, within which this manifests itself. But firstly, when it comes to the content that you're referencing and saying that it is out there for forever, is there no way of basically having some way of, of deleting this content? So you've asked a very important question. There may be some ways of deleting it, but things that have already been captured and saved, how is one going to access that? One cannot have control over what has been posted out there and people have had access to already. So I think this continues to remain a challenge and a grave concern for victims that have suffered and been subjected to this kind of exploitation. How prevalent is the sexual abuse and exploitation of young children and adolescents in this country? I think something that we are finding more and more on a daily basis where children have been victims of commercial sexual exploitation and of course child pornography in our experiences within our organizations, we are finding an increased incidence of referrals where children have been subjected to this victimization. So the statistics are not an accurate reflection. I do believe that it's underreported and underestimated. All of this most of the time is taking place on the internet. Are we doing any better at developing mechanisms that do protect children, even if these children have been coerced into sending this content, which oftentimes also uh, becomes the case where peop, uh, you know, predators go into the DMs of young girls and young boys and you, they, they end up following this trail and, and effectively send pictures and that turns out to be something else entirely. So uh, what we're finding is that a lot of children have been 
uh, provided with the opportunities of greater awareness within school structures and community platforms, and a lot more resources have been made available. But despite that, we are finding that children are still subjected to this kind of victimization, especially children who are emotionally needy and are definitely more vulnerable because of their unmet emotional needs. And sometimes, because of the grooming process, a child is not actually in a position to say no or to stop the progress of this kind of victimization. Dr. Omar, how difficult is it to uncover something like this, especially if it's happening in people's homes, where we have um, one of the daughters of, 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 of this convicted criminal being one of his victims? So, once again, you are absolutely correct. I think we mustn't forget that children can be subjected to this trauma within the places of uh, expected security and safety, which is homes and which is often the places one would not easily look out for or suspect. So how common is it in being detected? It's not very common unless there's any accidental disclosures or age inappropriate behaviors manifested by the child or uh, other uh, inappropriate behaviors that may be identified at school. So it is actually a very challenging situation, and we need to uh, ensure that we continue to reach out to children and to families and to the communities out there to be more aware and alert of the existence of crime, crimes such as uh, the capturing of child pornography, distribution, etc.